So I think we can get started. And now that we're recording this, so now that time is set up. Uh, so I wanted, first of all, to thank all of you for being here today. And I wanted to thank the French Italian Department, uh, CSCL, the MIMS Graduate Program, and the Italian Cultural Center for the generous support for Alessia's visit. And obviously, thank uh, Alessia for having accepted our invitation and then you've been so generous with your time uh, doing a short visit uh, here in the Twin Cities. Um, Alessia Ricciardi is a professor of French, uh, Italian Comparative Literature at Northwestern University. Uh, she has a BA in uh, Philosophy from the University of Pisa. Uh, then she went on to, uh, to get an MA in Psychoanalysis from Paris 7, and then she moved to the States to Yale to study with Peter Brooks and getting a PhD in Comparative Literature at Yale uh, University. Um, Alessia's first book, The Ends of Morning, was published by Stanford University Press in 2003, and uh, she, uh, with this book she won the MLA Scaglione Prize for Comparative Literature. Uh, her second book, uh, After la Dolce Vita, uh, was published again by Stanford in 2012 and won again the MLA Prize, this time uh, in, uh, in Italian, uh, the, Bright, the Scalione Prize for Italian Studies. And uh, after La Dolce Vita uh, offers a genealogy of uh, Berlusconi's uh, Italy and analyzes uh, from a theoretical and philosophical point of view uh, the responsibility of uh, Italian cultural left uh, in the rise to power of uh, Berlusconi. And even if Berlusconi is not uh, around uh, anymore or so much, or, uh, or that's what we would hope, I, uh, Alessia's book uh, still offers uh, a really compelling uh, framework to understand what's going on today uh, in Italy, what's the left uh, today in Italy, and uh, the, the, the rise to power of the epoch of uh, Matteo Renzi, our current uh, uh, leftist, I guess, or something like that, prime minister. Um, Alessia's work has also appeared in venues uh, PMLA, Modernism and Modernity, Modern Languages Notes, Diacritics, uh, the Romantic Review, and California Italian Studies Journal. Uh, she has written on Proust, Godard, Lacan, Pasolini, and Dargamben, uh, Bazin as well, as um, among other things, Fellini as well. So, and uh, in her essays dedicated to Italian culture, Alessia was able to combine a precise knowledge of Italy's social cultural history with the sensibilities uh, uh, inspired by critical theory and cultural studies. And with her writings, she provides an example of how to effectively combine, combine history and theory, cultural critique, and close reading. Uh, currently, Alessia is writing her third book, book, which is titled Woman as a Form of Life, Gender Politics in Antonioni's Film. And uh, the project that, uh, uh, and the, the presentation she do today is, uh, I guess, a chapter from uh, this book, more or less. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Alessia uh, to the University of Minnesota. And, uh, and then uh, Alessia will, uh, will give her talk and then Professor Cesare Casarino will moderate uh, the debate afterwards. Thank you Cesare for having me. Thanks Alessia. Thank you so much Lorenzo uh, uh, for having invited me here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, thank you, uh, Cesare, for uh, your hospitality, and Akim, it was a pleasure to see you again, and of course Tom. Uh, I found uh, uh, old friends and uh, very important acquaintances here, uh, and uh, I'm so glad and happy uh, to have the opportunity to present to you uh, what I would define as just a portion of the chapter of this work on uh, Antonioni and on Antonioni's tetralogy, so the films with Monica Vitti, going from Aventura and uh, ending with a desert, uh, with in between La Notte and Le Cris. Uh, I have years to, <laughs> um, two folds as you were. One uh, uh, will contain a sort of introductory uh, paragraphs uh, to the project as a whole because I just would like to explain uh, as well as I can uh, what I'm trying to do and then I will focus more on uh, just Red Desert as promised and or on the Anne Carson's uh, reading of uh, Red Desert uh, because that reading to me is uh, uh, fundamental. 
and uh, so I will grapple hopefully with your help and uh, I look forward to, to your feedback. Uh, I will grapple with, with her understanding of uh, Monica Vitti's uh, uh, impersonation of the sublime in Red, in red Desert. Uh, okay, let's uh, start uh, with a sort of preliminary uh, uh, attempt at an explanation. So in a, re a recent collection of essays, Thomas L. Sasser maintains that the mythology at work in European film has arrived at a crisis point because it relates the stories of, and I quote, losers, survivors of catastrophe, end quote. And more pointedly for our purposes is, uh, I quote, asymmetrically gendered, uh, end quote, in comparison to the rule book of Hollywood movie convention. According to this view, the stock genre favored by Hollywood directors represent examples of reversible and thus symmetrical patriarchal narratives insofar as melodrama, horror, and science fiction often feature supposedly empowered female protagonists. By contrast, European authors such as, and I quote, Pasolini, Antonioni, Tarkovsky, Wenders, Angelopoulos, and others, allegedly offer an endless series of, I quote, more or less honest self-portraits through the treatment of the male protagonists. So in this sense, it's obvious that Sasser is trying to uh, rule out the possibility for this category of authors of being, of expressing anything but patriarchy in their films. And yet, uh, uh, just let me say also this, uh, um, uh, in, in the wake uh, <coughs> in, um, of Chantal Ackerman's death, uh, one, one thing that I hope to show is uh, how uh, perhaps uh, uh, Antonio's, uh, Antonioni's ability to break uh, free of linear narrative and direct explanation might have had something to do uh, with their uh, uh, own breathtaking, a uh, groundbreaking uh, representation of women and women's concerns in their beautiful, in their beautiful films. Um, so my view of European cinema is very different from Elsasser, at least with respect to the contributions of Michelangelo Antonioni. Indeed, I believe that in Antonioni's great uh, tetralogy of films featuring Monica Vitti, La Ventura, 1960, La Notte, 61, L'Eclisse, 62, Deserto Rosso, 64, he clearly expresses an impulse towards, <coughs> towards cross-gender identification in his rapt depictions of empowered women. Huh? And the cross-gender identification is a concept coming from Kajal Silverman in the acoustic mirror. Empowerment may be understood in this context to derive from the critical acuity with which women see through the mystification of contemporary capitalism while improvising forms of life that are compatible with modernity. So in a woman as a form of life, I set out to show through innovative approaches to narrative uh, I, uh, to show how, through innovative approaches to narrative, cinematography, and sound, Antonioni visualized the experiences of women during the heyday of Italy's so-called economic miracle in the early 60s as entirely new forms of life. What we encounter in his productions with Vitti is a gestalt switch regarding gender, according to which the usual relationship between women and men as grand to figure is reversed. Antonioni, I will contend, represented the female protagonist of the tetralogy as practicing their own art and style of existence, as uniquely attentive to the social, ethical, and political contingencies of the present, and thus as open to imaginative possibilities that the film's male characters generally seem unable or unwilling to entertain. In other words, the films are less about changes of cultural norms or individual psychology than about the new modes of relationality in which the woman plays the crucial role of witness. 
um, the gender politics of Antonioni's cinema thus should be understood as revolving not around traditional definition of women's identity in terms of social equality through work or se sexual emancipation through the revolt against repression but rather around the challenging questions raised by experimentations with new affective and ethical forms of love. And I don't know if uh, through this kind of framework I will manage to bypass uh, the impasse between essentialism versus revendications of rights uh, pertaining to the Anglo-Saxon uh, tradition. Um, as early as the mid-50s, Antonioni demonstrated evident interest in women's perspective in the film Le Amiche, or The Girlfriends, which is somewhat loosely based on Pavese Tra Donne Sole. Not until the 60s, however, does he develop a fully articulated and original methodology for representing their experiences on screen, an approach that organically encompasses narrative, cinematography, and sound. Consequently, the plots of the films in the tetralogy become looser, the shot composition and editing more rapid and elliptical, the soundtrack gradually more discordant or inexistent. According to Teresa de Lauretis, the lack of narrative closure that Antonioni's mature productions exhibit as a rule always denotes the feminization of the film basically signifying the equivalent of a symbolic castration. In this sense, the tetralogy transformation of the role of the woman from one character among others to the first person witness of the narrative events is decisive. We might almost suppose that Antonioni's films together provide an antithetical rejoinder to the Hollywood's comedy of remarriage celebrated by Sally Cavell. According to Cavell, the screwball comedies that directors such as Howard Oakes, Frank Capra, George Cukor, etc., made during the heyday of the studio system, reframed the philosophical question, philosophical question of moral perfectionism in terms of divorce and remarriage. In Antonioni's production, Starry Vitti, however, Moral authority resides with the woman in the drama of averting or undoing a traditional couple. This drama never unfolds as the acting out of a woman's repressed or buried feelings a la Eric Ibsen. Watching Antonioni's films, we're not reminded of Ibsen at Doll's House, which Cavell cites as one of the main genealogical sources of his comedies of remarriage. When both Antonioni and, Dick and Ingmar Bergman died on the same day in 2007, journalists and other commentators made much of their alleged elective affinities. Yet Antonioni was never interested in his character psychologies in conventional terms as Bergman obviously was. The Italian filmmakers focus on women in the tetralogy has much more to do with this desire to deconstruct the cinematic equivalence between femininity and interiority. And now I try to plunge uh, into Red Desert, and uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the plot. I'll try to summarize it uh, briefly for those of you who might not be familiar with the plot, but of course the film is a, a plastic uh, uh, kind of work and uh, so the plot would do little to really explain what's going on, but uh, I think it might be useful just to go over the main events, if we can call them uh, such. So we first see Giuliana, Monica Vitti, walking with her little boy Valerio and dressed in a beautiful green coat and Valerio has a yellow coat on the side of a road near the petrochemical plant managed by her husband Ugo on the outskirts of Ravenna. Giuliana enters the plant to find Ugo, introduces her to Corrado Zeller, a, a business associate visiting Ravenna to recruit a skilled labor for a new venture in Patagonia. After Giuliana departs, we learn from conversation between the two men that she recently survived a car accident that left her convalescing for a month in a clinic. 
Corrado pursues Juliana, visiting her at an empty storefront where she plans to open her own business and taking her along on excursions to interview workers. While Hugo is away on a business trip, Valerio complains uh, the song of having no feeling in his legs and seems unable to stand up. Juliana grows distraught, but when Valerio asks her to entertain him with a story, she agrees. She recounts, she recounts the tale of a girl who lives on an island where she spent all of her time alone on a beach of a pink sand. Uh, uh, Juliana ends the story and leaves Valerio momentarily, but returns to find him standing and walking in his bedroom, making clear that his paralysis was uh, fame. She visits Corrado at his hotel, where he forces himself on her, and they awkwardly, perhaps, have intercourse. If you do understand, if they, do they have or don't they have intercourse? I don't know. At the end of the film, we see Julian and Valerio once again walking through the empty fields near the plant. Uh, uh, he asks her if the birds are being poisoned by the yellow emissions pouring from the plant's moustache. And uh, uh, she replies that they have learned not to fly too close to the smoke. So this is uh, the, the, the film's itinerary. Of course, colors play a very important role, and uh, Antonioni painted the streets, uh, like in gray, for example, where uh, Juliana wants to open a, a store, a gray, whitish, and uh, the screen is flattened by use of photo, telephoto lens. Uh, the, the aesthetic of the film, and we'll see a few clips, uh, uh, is, uh, um, is very uh, striking. So, uh, the four uh, great films that Michelangelo Antonioni made in the, 60s, uh, in the 60s, the last of which I will henceforth refer to by its English title, Red Desert, insist on the importance of women as what we might call minoritarian subjects, to cite the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze. Deleuze here means subject whose becomings reveal the emptiness of majoritarian standards and who thus represents agents of change. The sexual politics of Antonioni's tetralogy revolves not around traditional definition, again, of women's identity in terms of social equality, uh, but rather around the question that women raised by experimenting with new forms of life in modern society. New forms of life prevail in his films insofar as he depicts women whose aesthetic and ethical choices reflect neither the expectation of the melodramatic imagination, let's say betrayal, adultery, uh, nor the dull, dullness of quotidian activities. What is at stake for Antonioni, in other words, is a process of becoming that results in the event of becoming woman, to invoke the contested notion that Deleuze and Gattari introduced in A Thousand Plateau. Becoming woman has to do with developing what the two philosophers call a micro-femininity, which emerges at the opposite end of the spectrum from the molar concerns of grand historical movement. If the first film of the tetralogy is titled La Ventura, is to stress the marvelous experiment that Antonioni is inaugurating, choosing to make women and not men, as the tradition wants, the subject of a quasi-chivalric adventure. To put it differently, Antonioni's heroines show us what it might have meant to become women in Italy at the time of the economic miracle by affirming an idea of the sublime. His female protagonists embody the thrill of freedom that we feel in the imagination when we confront an overwhelming power that defies reason. This feeling is, in a real sense, the attitude of the and Gattari micro-femininity in relation to the molar logic of accepted institutions and practices. If we fully embrace the Leusian terminology for a moment, we may say that women in the tetralogy respond to the prevailing organization of society, not with the tiredness of their bodies, but rather with the vitality of their brains. Eh? This is something that uh, Deleuze also says in Cinema 2, and uh, uh, I feel that it's a very powerful statement, especially if one was to discuss uh, 
GTS, the personification of the sublime, as Anne Carson uh, tries to do. Uh, I also would like, a, uh, for the in, in the spirit of uh, creating uh, a, a local uh, polemical, perhaps uh, uh, um, uh, sort of a suggestion, that, uh, for example, Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, uh, capitalist suggestion for women on leaning in uh, is counteracted by Antonioni's instead uh, insistence in uh, uh, shooting his uh, protagonist uh, leaning against the wall. And, uh, but you know, it's not clear who is uh, uh, better positioned to resist uh, in a more interesting way. Yet, in what, uh, uh, in what ways can we say that Julian and Red Desert exemplify ways of being and thinking that belong to a broader philosophical genealogy of the sublime, as recent interpreters such as Matthew Gandhi, Angelo Restivo, and Dan Carson have proposed? In what follows, I would argue that our recognition of the family resemblance between Juliana's state of mind, of course, often described as just uh, uh, hysterical and neurotic. Uh, most, uh, especially male critics, uh, define uh, Juliana as, uh, you know, mad, uh, the, the, the paradigm of the hysteric. And the theory of the sublime is a necessarily deferred insight. This is the case because Antonioni's depiction of her plight grows more legible over time as a work of art about not just the patriarchal brutality of modern Italian culture, but also the catastrophe of men's uh, privileging of technology over ecology. For contemporary spectators, the film has become progressively less mysterious and more traumatic, gaining urgency with the advance of climate change in the manner of what Freud would have called, Freud and especially Lacan, uh, Nachtreglichkeit or afterwardness. Uh, the very title of the film, Red Des The Red Desert, flirts with suggestions of science fiction, perhaps evoking thoughts of the planet Mars. If we consider this association in lights of visual motifs such as the space age machinery of the planet where uh, Hugo works, the toy robot that Valerio plays with, uh, the, the Valerio plays with in a key scene, or the news headline announcing the threat of nuclear Armageddon in the Clisse, the film preceding the desert in the tetralogy, Antonioni's fascination with the genre seems obvious. Yet we should not be too quick to jump to conclusions regarding the significance of the name. In fact, Red Desert is the only title in the director filmography that lacks a specific referent in the plot of the film itself. There is at one point a red hat, but uh, you know, uh, you may. From a story of a love affair to the cry, the girlfriends, la ventura, la notte, blow up, the passenger, the prisky point, identification of a woman, and so forth. Each of Antonioni's other productions derives its name from an explicit theme or figure that metaphorically implies a multiplicity of related meanings. Antonioni's first foray into color cinematography, however, never actually visualizes or thematizes Red Desert. The label Red Desert thus functions less as a metaphor than as a metonym insofar as it signals an arbitrary contiguity between two terms rather than a symbolic relationship of resemblance or analogy. Moreover, the abstractness of the relation between signifier and signified may be understood to enforce a kind of realism. With the contemporary onslaught of global warming, water scarcity and desertification, the title of the film belatedly achieves a literal force. In our day, the desert is transformed from a potential symbol of natural aridity and mortality to a natural byproduct of industrial devastation. Antonioni's film, in other words, compels us to reconsider the relationship between potentiality and actuality in the work of art. Its cinematic oeuvre remains relevant at least in part because it exemplifies a potentiality that rarely is squandered in narrative or symbolic acting out. Red Desert reveals itself to be not only a form of vibrant matter, to borrow Jane, Jane Bennett Felicito's turn of phrase, but one that is sublime, threatening, and enigmatic. 
we may see these qualities on display in a well-known sequence early in the film in which Hugo and Corrado, while exiting the plant, watch a massive cloud of steam that bursts forth from a ventilation shaft to engulf both the field of vision as well as the viewer. Um, in his uh, magisterial essay, Modernism, Postmodernism and Steam, T.J. Clarke reminds us that from the 19th century onward, steam in art came to represent not merely an image of our ghostly material discontents, which equals evanescence. As he actually declares, it was always also an image of power. Steam was what initially made the machine world possible. It was the middle term in mankind's great reconstruction of nature, rain, steam, and speed. Here, however, we see the steam billowing from the plant near Ravenna, neither as occult symbol nor as image of power, but rather as the operatic, violent, and possibly toxic effluvium of global industry erupting after two centuries of being harnessed by technology. Of the commentators who have remarked on Giuliana's affinity for the sublime in Red Desert, surely the most brilliant is Anne Carson, a Canadian poet, essayist, translator, professor of classical literature, and former graphic artist, Carson at Swan Guggenheim and MacArthur Fellowship and the Lannan Literary Award. A writing restlessly uh, uh, mixes genre and styles, weaving together lyric verse prose fiction, sorry, prose poetry, fiction, biography, drama, scholarly criticism, essay, and translation into a kaleidoscopic and hauntingly elusive synthesis. She often just opposes historically disparate frames of reference and literary sources. And her background as a classicist and visual artist fully equips her to interrogate the limits of imaginative discourse by mobilizing ideas drawn from philosophy and aesthetics. In her 2005 book, De Creation, she treats Monica Vitti's performances in Antonioni's motion picture of the 60s as a matter of high philosophical seriousness. Carson revisits the stories of Claudia, Giuliana, and Vittoria, where the three main characters played by Vitti in, respectively, La Vettura, The Desert, and L'Eclisse, in a crucial sequence of four lyric poems. Through each poem's retelling, the erotic power struggle between Vitti and the lover, which forms each field's dramatic nucleus, also supplies the palimpsest for a critical dispute between the authorial voice of the woman poet and the fragmentary interruption of a celebrated male philosopher. Plato is the interloper in the first of the four poems, Kant in the second, and fourth, and Longinus in the third. 
Carson, in fact, has confessed in an interview in Paris Review that what motivated her to write the poems in the creation was the intuition that, I quote, Monica Vitti embodied the sublime, especially in Red Desert, end quote. As historical precedence of this intuition, she invokes various people's versions of the theory of sublime, uh, Edmund Burke, Kant, Antonionis himself. Yet, uh, the odd-sounding assertion that the actress embodied uh, this theory subtly suggests uh, the novelty of the argument made by Carson in the poems, implying that for the poet, uh, the sublime is a personal attribute that can be expressed bodily, like agility or compulsion. For philosophers such as Burke and Kant, uh, the notion instead would have signified a purely internal subjective response to either the magnitude or force of a, or, or, of a physical imposing external object, what Kant classified as either the mathematical or dynamical sublime. In the same interview, Carson aptly summarizes the traditional understanding of the concept, and I quote, in the conventional description of the sublime, like Kant's, there is usually a trigger for the from the phenomenal world a thunderstorm, or a cliff, or a vast starry night, vertigo of the infinite, from which the self recoils in horror or dread, and then recovers itself. Dread followed by a recovery of the feeling of mastery, a soaring sensation of, look at this incredible dread, and how I rise above it with my amazing human mind." End quote. Both Burke and Kant, in their writings on the sublime, stress the dissymmetry in might between the overpowering object of attention and the inadequate subject. Kant indeed argues that precisely by confronting the limits of rational sense in the sublime object, the subject encounters the supersensible or universal condition of its own necessity, which harmonizes the faculty of thought with nature like moral law. By contrast, Carson gives near manic emphasis on the subject recovery of the feeling of mastery and the sense of exhilaration in her own personal individual vivacity of mind. Moreover, the poet's association of the sublime with mastery of oneself gives a strong hint of what is at stake from the perspective of sexual politics in nominating Monica Vitti as the exemplar of an aesthetics historically advocated by male thinkers. In the creation, Carson repeatedly turns to images of Vitti performing the recalling and recovery of Antonioni's heroine from a phenomenal world, uh, uh, world whose most immediate threats arise from the attempts of men to exert control over nature, culture, and women. For the sake of time and clarity, we will consider only the first of the two poems in the volume that are based on Red Desert, an Ode to the Sublime by Monica Vitti. The, the title of the other poem is Mia Moglie, Longinus Red Desert, eh? my, my, uh, my wife Longinus Red Desert. Um, so Ode to the Sublime by Monica Vitti as a, the, the lyric is entitled, purports to be a first-person monologue in free verse delivered by Vitti while speaking character as Giuliana. Her soliloquy consists of a series of, declar of declarative sentences in which she recounts details of crucial episodes from the film that shed light on her relationship with Ugo, the husband, and Corrado, pseudo-lover. An irregular but persistent repetition of the word everything runs through the string of declaration <laughs> like a nervous tick. Here is the opening of the poem. I want everything. Everything is a naked thought that strikes. A foghorn sounding through, the, through fog makes the fog seem to be everything. Quail eggs eaten from the hand in fog make everything aphrodisiac. My husband shrugs when I say so. My husband shrugs at everything. The lakes where his factory has uh, poisoned everything are as beautiful as Bruegel. Later in her speech, Juliana explains by means of a scholarly paraphrase why she ascribes such pivotal importance to, uh, importance to the obsessively repeated key terms, everything. 
Kant says, exists only in our mind, attended by emotion of uh, uh, pleasure and pain. A reference to Kant elegantly summarizes at least three of the philosopher's assertions in, the, in his critical judgment. First, that everything runs up into the concept of taste as a critical faculty. Second, the true sublimity must be thought only in the mind of the judging subject. And third, that the mind feels itself set in motion in the representation of the sublime, like, and I quote, a vibration, rapidly alternating repulsion and attraction produced by one and the same object. In light of the deliberately Kantian overtones of her terminology, Juliana's assertion in the poem, early lines, sound like knowing a vowels of the sublime menace and the enormity of her world. The fog horn sounding through fog, for example, conjures up a celebrated sequence from the film in which Juliana, Ugo, Corrado, and another pair of friends loiter in a dense fog on the waterfront of Ravenna until Juliana succumbs to fear and tries to drive off by herself in the group's car, only to break at the edge of a dock just before plunging into the water. She's dressed in a very Anna Karina kind of coat. <laughs> This is one of the most famous shots of the film because of the composition. This is Hugo the husband, very short name, therefore, you know, kind of severe. Corrado, slightly more uh, romantic, at least uh, uh, when it comes to his name. In the poem's evocation of this incident, the synesthetic confusion between the foghorn sound and the apparition of the fog seem to increase the perceived scale of both phenomena, making the fog seem to be everything, which is to say, all pervasive and inescapable. A similar widening of perspective occurs over the next three lines. Juliana reminds us in the first how she alone tests the magical ability to, and I quote, make everything aphrodisiac, that her friends during a party jokingly ascribe to Queen X. In the second, she signals how Hugo's apathetic impulse to shrug at everything, including her, has brought about an impasse in their marriage. In the third, she grants how his hand in the destruction of Ravenna's natural environment has led her to, the, to an epiphany. And I quote again from the poem, the lakes where his factory has poisoned everything are as beautiful as Bruegel, end quote. Each occurrence of the word everything in this line, it seems to me, marks a progressive enlar enlargement of the ethical and political grounds of which Juliana builds an increasingly bleak indictment of her social circle. Her critique progresses from conceding the gripness of her friends to noting the emotional detachment of her husband and finally to condemning the violence with which he, he and the technocracy to which he belongs make use of diverse resources. Comparing the lakes poisoned by Hugo's work at, uh, at the plant to the beauty of a painting by Peter Bruegel the Elder might seem at first glance like a weirdly cryptic and anachronistic turn of phrase for readers who are acquainted with modern English verse. However, Juliana's invocation of the 16th century Dutch artist cannot help but call to mind W.H. Auden's superb Musée des Beaux-Arts. And this is uh, uh, the Bruegel's painting uh, in question in Auden's poem. Auden's 1936 poem, of course, is a celebrated example of technique of ekphrasis, 
which is to say a literary account of a visual work of art, more specifically a rhetorical performance that claims to speak out of or on behalf of the object of description. Musée des Beaux-Arts begins with the grim affirmation, I quote, about suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters, end quote. The poem contends that what the early modern painters understood so well about human misery is the contrast between the victim's perception of the immensity of their pain and the bystander's sense of its ordinariness, or, as the speaker puts it, how such agony, and I quote, takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along, end quote. As it nears its conclusion, Auden's masterpiece advances a reading of Rugel's Icarus, in which the poetry gives memorable voice to the painting's depiction of how, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken crowd, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water. And the expensive, delicate ship that must have uh, seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. Juliana's claim in Ode to the Sublime by Monica Svitti, that the lakes polluted by, you, by Hugo are as beautiful as Bruegel, resonates with the ending of Monsieur de Bazaar in two important respects. First, her allusion in the preceding line to the party where she eats the quail eggs prompts us to recall that the Red Desert, the party goers, are interrupted by the appearance of a gigantic, slow-moving freighter outside the windows. As Juliana and her friend discover later, this cargo liner has arrived at Ravenna, Maine's commercial port, in order to enter quarantine for an onboard outbreak of disease. The vessel thus represents a deadly mutation of the expensive, delicate ship of Bruegel's painting and Odin's ectrasis, at once a powerful engine of trade and its infected waste product. Second, by finding something of Bruegel's in Ravenna ruined lakes, Juliana seems to glance back at the catastrophe of Icarus drowning with the eye, uh, 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 to considering its ominous implication for her own story. Describing the mythical child who melted his wings by flying too close to the sun as a boy falling out of the sky, Auden provides Juliana with a chilling image of what fate may await both the birds flying overhead at the end of Red Desert and their own little boy Valerio, whose question about emissions from the plant smokestacks raised the specter of the birds' extinction. If Auden's reading of Icarus underscores the horror of the winged boy's punishment for trusting human ingenuity too much, Juliana's tacit thought of this horror while contemplating the devastation of Ravenna at Tugo's hands enables us to understand the reference to Bruegel as a gesture not towards the beautiful, despite her own use of the, the adjective, but rather towards the sublime. Following this line, Juliana issues her Kantian's Ars Poetica, which quickly develops into a recollection of her tortured lovemaking with uh, Corrado. Um, everything, uh, are we on the right page? Yes. Everything, Kant says, exists only in our mind, attended by emotion of pleasure and pain that throws itself back and forth in me when I lay on Corrado's bed, fighting with everything, with Corrado's watching from across the room. Uh, then he came to the bed and mounted me, and this made no difference, except now I had to fight everything through. Corrado, which I did, undaunted, so Kant, on his freezing bed in its midnight glare. Huh? It's really bad sex. <laughs> although, although here Juliana drolly punctuates her account of the pair's sexual gymnastic 
with direct citation of Kant's critique of judgment, her narrative quickly reverses the gendering of the philosopher's aesthetics. Canonical theories of the sublime in the 18th century implicitly align the beautiful with the feminine and the sublime with the masculine. According to Christine Buttersby, Burke and Kant's very language assumes the premise that women are too weak to sustain the visionary flights of imagination required to appreciate the sublime. <coughs> Because the sublime involves a power of resistance within us, the proper judge of such experience, as far as Kant is concerned, can only be a man who is undaunted, knows no fear, and sets manfully to work with full deliberation, as the philosopher maintains in section 28 of the critique entitled Nature as Might. In his eyes, the prerequisite explains why every civilization admires the figure of the soldier of the, over that of the statesman. Why, and I quote, war itself has something sublime about it, and quote, whereas a long peace gives rise to, and I quote, a mere commercial spirit, and with it a debasing effeminacy. And quote, critique, page 112. Yet Juliana's appropriation of the Kantian epithet undaunted to describe herself seems entirely fitting insofar as she is the only character that has to demonstrate any power or resistance to her conditions, 